and we are live. So thank you for uh, everyone that uh, has made uh, and put time aside for our webinar today, um, which is safe and protect in, time, in times of reset. And we will be uh, talking today um, with uh, David Bloom, who is intellectual property specialist at Safeguards IP, an IP insurance company, as well as uh, Richard Nagin, head of uh, IP strategy for uh, Polar IP. Um, I'll be chairing the session. My name is uh, Timo. I am CEO for Cosmonauts, as well as Pekama, uh, an IP intelligence platform that does a bunch of cool stuff. Um, which we're always happy to show you guys. Uh, but uh, really, we'll be talking about how to manage uh, intellectual property budget today. We'll be talking about mitigating risk, uh, as well as uh, unlocking new opportunities um, and being a bit more entrepreneurial with your IP portfolio. Uh, and that goes both for um, attorneys out there servicing IP portfolios of customers, but also IP managers and, and, and CTOs and whoever may be managing the portfolio in, in uh, SMEs and in large uh, organizations. Uh, but before we start, uh, we maybe get uh, a few words from both uh, Richard and David here uh, on, on their experience, of course. But I, I have two specific questions to each and, and one of you. And I start with you, David. Um, what is IP insurance? I mean, this is something that uh, m most people um, maybe scratch their head around and, and ask you, is that thing even exist? It does. It certainly does exist. It's been, <laughs> as, if you look at the polls, I've said a question as to when the first policy was sold in the UK, and it's, uh, you might be surprised by the answer. So it certainly exists. It's been around for some time. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's a product that's certainly developed over time and in the last two or three years has really come into its own. Uh, just by way of background, um, Safeguard IP is the UK's only dedicated IT, IP insurance broker. I founded it about four years ago, um, but in my previous life, I was an IP litigator for 15 years in London. Um, and throughout my career, I had uh, great companies, IP rich companies that had uh, done all the right things in terms of capturing their IP, registering it in terms of patents, spending considerable sums of money. But actually when issues arose in terms of third parties copying their IP or then being sued for IP infringement, um, they were always shocked um, when I told them how much it might cost to um, deal with those claims. IP lawyers, unfortunately, are very expensive. Um, so uh, about four or five years ago, I, I looked at ways where uh, companies, um, IP rich companies, can mitigate that particular cost risk and uh, set up Safeguard IP and work with some insurance companies to develop um, some products that are really um, valuable uh, in that regard. Um, so I like to think in the first half of my career, I uh, helped... Uh, clients save save their IP at a high uh, cost, but now I look to save companies' costs by um, advising them on IP insurance. And the way it works essentially is if, if a claim arises and you have a policy in place, um, the insurer will fund the cost of either enforcing your IP or defending an action against a claim that you've infringed someone else's IP. So at the very basic level, that's what they do. Fantastic. Well, that actually leads us to the to the, our first poll question, which was uh, put together by, by you, David. And the question is, in what year was the first IP insurance policy sold in the UK? Um, we've got a few answers already, uh, and, and, and they are on the year 1996. Please don't reveal the answer yet. Uh, we'll, we'll do so at the end. Um, and in the meantime, um, we have uh, Richard here. Um, uh, on behalf of uh, Color IP, uh, can you tell us a bit more about about yourself, Richard, about Color and and really what what is IP strategy? I think that it, it probably means different things for different people. Yes. Um, so hello, I'm I'm Richard Nugent. I work at Color IP as head of IP strategy, and um, you know my experience has it, it began uh, also a bit like David. Um, you know, more in a, a legal uh, sector. Um, however, I moved fairly quickly from, from contracts into IP and then began managing IP um, assets within a company, research entity, and then also um, managing their contracts at that time. Uh, later, I moved into IP consulting 
and uh, that it sort of was a fairly natural flow. Um, and then now I'm, you know, at Color IP the past uh, few years. Um, so, you know, our work at um, Color is is very much focused on IP commercialization. Um, so that ranges from anything from you know auditing assets and helping people with their intangible assets right through to valuation and transactions. Um, and in terms of what is IP strategy, well, IP strategy, you're absolutely right, Timo. It, it does mean many things to, to many people. But uh, for us, really what IP strategy is about is, is helping people to, to access uh, and, and drive revenue from their, their intangible assets and to make the most of their intangible assets. Um, so it's also helping them to do this in a way which is nimble and helps them avoid um, avoid problems as they go down that path, whilst at the same time unlocking the the, the, the most opportunities possible. Thank you, thank you, Richard. Um, so I'm going to be ending the poll, guys, in about two minutes. So last tries to answer the question. Um, I mean, certainly now we have uh, all the time uh, in the world to actually slow down, uh, reflect on things, reflect on practices that uh, um, we have been religiously following for, 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 for years, if you, if, if you wish. Practices that we all know that are imperfect, but, but work well enough uh, for, for, for us to carry on. Um, I mean, we have the time now to... Uh, you know, maybe think of alternatives. So to IP owners out there, what they should be prioritizing or at least paying closer attention to right now? Do you guys think that should be um, putting a bit more rationale uh, around spending, um, maybe looking at alternative providers, maybe even looking at alternative uh, ways of, 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 of doing things? Um, should they be looking more at trying to generate alternative revenue using their IP portfolio, uh, whether that will be through licensing or even prosecution, or whether, uh, or whether should be focusing more on protection. And I'm not just talking about the conventional um, sense of protection, which is, okay, let's patent, let's trademark stuff, uh, you know, let's, let's cover our trade secrets, but also looking at IP insurance, for example. I mean, I think that what's been happening to us has definitely made us uh, think differently about risk and how we should uh, be prepared. You have frozen on us, Timo. Excuse me? You, you froze there. Oh, I froze there? How about now? All good? All good. Yeah, it's good. So, so maybe, maybe go, uh, go to you first, uh, Richard. Um, maybe, maybe you tell us a bit more about alternative uh, revenue streams uh, using intellectual property to the ones that are, are, are kind of commonly known. Certainly. Um, I might have gone into audio only mode. Uh, I'm getting a notification here on, uh, on connection uh, issues, but um, that, that could well be on my side. Um, that, that's all right. We can hear you loud and clear. We cannot see you that, loud, but I'm good. sure we can see um, that. I think in terms of you know, accessing you know, new opportunities um, and new revenue streams, I think what we find is that uh, you know, this is a time where companies can really take a long, hard look at the intangible assets they have. And once they look at those assets, they can either decide that maybe it's the time to move on, move past some some of those assets and defocus from them. But it could also be an opportunity to look at what assets are able to generate revenue that maybe aren't generating revenue right now. So that could be either um, selling the IP or licensing out the IP or using it indeed within their own business in perhaps a way that it hasn't been used before. Maybe it wasn't being used properly before. Um, so there, there's those sorts of um, you know, revenue opportunities. Um, it, it's also an opportunity to, to look at what else is out there, perhaps look at the, the sort of white space in their, in their particular uh, technical domain and see what opportunities are there that they could be getting into um, if, if they wanted to redirect their activities in that direction. And, and sometimes that can be funded by you know, dropping certain assets 
or dropping a certain technical direction because you know sometimes we find working with companies that they might have a particular asset but they're actually not using it and none of their particular you know product lines or revenue streams are directed towards the protection they get from that intangible asset so just um, spending a bit of time to to do that sort of uh, introspection if you like but also a uh, and a sort of a, a, a bit of a research into the market and the market dynamics, um, looking at the looking at competitors, that can be a great opportunity uh, at this time. So I think it's a great opportunity to do that and a great opportunity to innovate in this um, in this situation. Being being a bit more entrepreneurial, if you wish. Absolutely, yeah. And and we were we were actually talking about uh, that yesterday. We touched upon the fact that uh, often no one wants to make that call though. Uh, you know, yeah. people people don't want to be uh, don't want to be the person that says, okay, we'll stop renewing that patent. Uh, you know, maybe we shouldn't be filing in in X Y Z jurisdiction. You know, maybe maybe we shouldn't be expanding on the classes. Um, who should be making that call? Um, I mean, historically, you know, we we have either attorneys or or people that are very um, uh, how can I say focused around the R and D that will be managing the portfolio. Uh, do we need uh, more business-minded people being involved in the management of the portfolio, uh, which which tend to be slightly more um, both slightly more entrepreneurial? W what would you say? Is this something that can be taught? Um, if, if I just follow that up, um, if you don't mind, um, I think you know the way I look at this is it's actually it is a very challenging. Uh, issue for uh, particularly for, for people who are managing the the IP assets in a company, um, because you know nobody wants to be the guy who or, or the girl who is the one who's made the decision to drop an asset, and then two months down the line the, the CEO comes to them and says, "Well, I'd like to commercialize that now." Um, so that's <laughs> you know, no one wants to be that person. So that sort of um, that fear, if you want, to, if you want to call it that, is is often what drives some of these um, decisions to maintain intangible assets. Now, that is not an that is not a good IP strategy. Um, it is it is much better to to really look at the business angle, as you've um, rightly pointed out, to look at the, the business opportunities. Um, and sometimes, you know, companies do find it useful to use third parties to help make these decisions because then at the end of the day they can blame somebody it's not their fault oh we shouldn't have followed the we shouldn't have followed the view of that consultant you know it, it's it's easier for them if they got a third party to bring in and sometimes a third party can validate the the thought that they already had and that can be very useful too they can go to the ceo and say look i think we should drop these assets you know and here's why that the market shows it's going off in this other direction, and our assets are going in this, you know, a different direction. So, you know, getting information from third parties um, can be very useful, and using business people such as yourself, um, Timo, um, can also be very useful too. Is, is, is this same, same old story? Insurance. Say, 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 same old story, right? If something works, it was uh, it was my idea. But if it didn't work, it was the consultant's idea. Well, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's it's true. Um, um, you know, there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, <laughs> people, everyone's a human being. Um, yeah. So I don't think we should we should shy away from that truth. Um, you know. It's, uh, yeah. It, yeah, it, it is. It, it's what it is. But in any way, IP strategy or no IP strategy, one br one prompt by fear is certainly not a good one. So um, IP IP insurance. Um, I mean, this is really an alternative uh, to to something else, or is it in completely different category, uh, David? Like, who should be really looking at this? Who should be concerned by this? Is it the IP manager? Is it the CFO? Is it the in-house counsel? I mean, I think. I think going back at, to, your, to your previous question, I mean, I think it's a very interesting time for IP. Um, I mean, obviously, we've all heard the stat that 80% of business value is held in IT, IP and intangible assets, and it adds up to something like $50 trillion yeah. worldwide. I, I, think, I, 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 I vomit a little in my mouth yeah, every time I hear that. Absolutely. No one, no, no one knows. But there's no <laughs> doubt that, that IP and intangible assets are more valuable now than they have ever been. But I think they British are. businesses are notoriously bad at 
capturing their their, their IP and exploiting it, commercializing it for whatever reason. Um, and I think now, obviously, revenue will be down across the board, given what's happened. I think there will be an imperative on businesses to see what, what assets they have and how they can best utilize and exploit them. And IP undoubtedly, undoubtedly will be one of their key assets. So I think um, it's an interesting time for IP. I think we'll see IP put to work a lot more than has been in the past. So licensing or um, asset sales, what have you. And I think around that, there, there will be issues. Uh, if, you're exploit if more IP is being exploited, there will be more IP litigation. And then clearly, um, IP insurance is a solution to mitigate um, the, that cost risk. Um, but if you ask me who's, who's making the decision, well, the IP manager certainly will be involved. But clearly, um, the FD needs to be aware of how much it might cost if an issue arises, and he will therefore um, be involved in the decision as well. Because once people within the C-suite understand how expensive IP litigation can be, if you kind of go to them with, with a solution, it, it can be a value. It can it can vary a company really. I mean, if it's a, it can if do, it's yeah. a small if it's a smaller organization, all, all you need is uh, a, a lawsuit uh, brought in by by a large corporate. They'll yeah. bury you so much with paper that by the time you uh, bring the lawyer in, like you already yeah. go bust. So I've, I've, ne I've never met, I've never come across an SME that's budgeted for IP litigation. It just it doesn't happen, no. um, and um, and for good reason. Uh, yeah. But but, with, but without um, giving it some thought, it can be devastating for a business. And and I mean, like, what are the alternatives? You either go by it or you have to drop the patent. So I, I guess that a lot of people just just go by that uh, if they cannot afford uh, a, a loss. Yeah, if, if if they're being sued, um, they are in a position where they have to take a license. Mm. Um, and if a license is not being offered, they have to stop selling whatever they're selling mm. and pay damages. So yeah, it, it can be um, life threatening to a business. And and that actually brings us really to our. Uh, Kind of sub question, if you wish. I mean, how how do you measure that risk? I mean, we are talking about mitigating risk and applying practices and and you know bringing in products such as insurance or bringing in uh, specialists uh, such as yourself, Richard, into the equation to mitigate that risk. But how how is how is risk really measured? I mean, um, for, for 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 you, David, when 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 you come in and you start evaluating um, the potential for, for litigation, uh, either whether that's going to be like an incoming litigation or if, if uh, a customer will prompt one, how, how is that like even possible? It, I mean, the experience, um, each case is completely different. So if, you, if you're speaking to a software developer that wants to launch uh, a, a piece of software in the US, for example, uh, you know that that's a, f a fairly high risk because of the patent troll um, uh, risk. But if you've got a widget maker, a one-man band that's launching in the UK alone, then clearly, that, clearly that's a lower risk. So really, I need to know all the facts, and I take a view as to mm -hmm. um, where they where they sit on the scale of risk. But ultimately, it's the insurers who who decide what the risk is and price it accordingly. Because you really then take that risk upon yourself. I mean, I, as, as a broker, we, we just introduce the client to, to yeah. the insurer. And then the insurer, as I say, is it, they're, they're the party that assesses the risk. I, I understand. Um, and from, from your standpoint, um, Richard, when you're, when you're brought in, uh, of course, you know, every, every commercialization exercise does come along with a certain amount of risk. I mean, you know, no, no, no risk, no reward. Uh, Absolutely. So how, There's a there's a big risk to doing nothing. Um, you know, I think I think the risk of doing nothing is is often understated. Um, you know, inaction is, is sometimes um, seen as as less risky, but that's that's really not always the case. Um, I'm a big fan of make decisions. Um, Okay, some of those decisions may not end up being correct, but making decisions is generally a better way forward than being completely inactive. Um, so I think in terms of mitigating risk um, with IP, how we look at this is very much um, 
you know, well, first of all, there's there's different types of risk, as David as was pointed out. But for us, what we're always focusing our minds on is is the commercial opportunities um, and and how to access those. Um, so, you know, to mitigate risk, one way we can do that is through market intelligence. Uh, now, that, that that sort of market intelligence and competitive intelligence can be gleaned both through um, you know, advanced market information. Um, you know, we use a lot of proprietary sources for that. Um, also, a lot of uh, you know open source type information. But equally, um, from the, the patent information, there's a huge amount of information, which is information which can help you um, make decisions around risk. And um, you know, whenever we people come to us for patent research. They then often then use that research with their patent attorney um, to start to dig deep into. Okay, we can see that there's competitors. They have you know technologies similar or analogous to our technologies. Um, you know what is the issue for us? How big an issue is it for us? You know how close are their claims to our claims? What, those sorts of issues, and then you can start to really take a more refined view. But at the end of the day. You know, there's no guarantees in life. You can never really know um, in those types of projects if some guy in you know South Korea has has, has published something on his website. Um, you know th- those sorts of issues um, are always are always going to come and hit you. Um, so there's, but it's better. To, I generally take the view that it's better to do something than than nothing. Um, you know it's. Do, 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 do you feel that when it when it comes to IP, sometimes people have unrealistic expectations, in a sense in a sense of how how much can be known, how much can be can can be provided. I mean, people of course very much understand that this is perhaps their their most valuable asset, and rightfully they they try to um, you know mitigate that risk as, as much as possible. But as with any other aspect of business, it does require a certain amount of risk taking, um, and and, yes. and and of course, um, sometimes that that's difficult for people to swallow, especially when they're at the beginning of their IP journey. I guess that people and organizations that go, got um, you know large uh, size patent um, portfolios, of course, understand it. Um, but you know how 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 would you say that? You can kind of um, bring some clarity to this. Like, what what should people well, what, what should people really expect? I think a good example is to look at the situation we find ourselves in now. Uh, and in a sense, this situation we're in now is is a there's a pandemic situation, and we're we're dealing with the the effects of that, and that's having a lot of effect on multiple businesses. But you know, really, it's a to some extent, that the arising of this pandemic is a known unknown. You know, it's a. I, I, I remember the first time people started to talk to me about known unknowns and unknown unknowns and all this sort of thing. It sounds a bit crazy, but once you dig into it, you know, it, it was definitely known that pandemics do happen. Um, you know, and they do happen from time to time. What was unknown is the fact that you know, um, it's when it would come and, and how, what would the impact of it, of it would be. So, you know, the idea that we can have this sort of omniscient, um, you know, godlike knowledge of what's going to happen with our IP is just nonsensical to me. Um, so, you know, I think we need to have a bit more humility about these issues and realize that, you know, quite honestly, um, there's a lot out there we don't know and we've just got to act um, as best we see fit with the facts that are before us, having done as much due diligence to um, mitigate you know, risk and to acquire as much facts as possible to help us make those decisions. Uh, but I think in, in terms of mitigating mitigation risk, nothing changes um, from where we were before the pandemic to now and, and when we get through it. You know, there, there's certain things that every company can do to reduce the risk of either getting sued or yeah. um, having to sue third parties. And and, and and they apply at all times. Um, I mean, whenever I speak to clients, even if they have policies in place, I still try and educate them about what the steps they can take. They're fairly 
basic um, to ensure that the risk is lowered. Because even though the mitigation might be funded by the insurer, it's not necessarily a process businesses want to go through the management yeah. time, the stress, everything. So exactly. it, even if you have a policy in place, it's still definitely worth avoiding um, yeah. getting embroiled in, in a piece of litigation. So, you know, making records of who's doing what and when, so you know who's created the IP, um, registering IP where you can is important and will be even more important when we get through this. Um, you know, identifying your IP as being registered so the world knows it belongs to you, that was kind of potentially stop infringers. Um, but the one thing I do try and educate my clients about is the importance of creating an IP culture within a business so that it's recognized as a valuable asset and treated as one. So everything is done to protect it um, and raise awareness within the business about it. So that that will ensure that the value is maintained and issues are identified early and can be dealt with early. So having an IP culture is, is, is really fundamental to ensuring value is, is maintained in, in the asset. Yeah, if I could just pick up on that, David, I mean, that is definitely something, you know, we discuss a lot with clients is, is, is about this IP culture. Um, because, you know, it's not something that, that most companies will, will naturally have. It's not, it's not the number one priority of the CEO to uh, create a, an IP culture normally. Um, so this being the case, it doesn't take away from the, the value that an IP culture can provide to companies. So we certainly find that having these types of conversations uh, you know, at a senior management level can be really, really useful. Um, you know, all, all levels of the business can benefit from this. Um, it can it can really um, help people like even stay at the company because they feel they're they're in an IP centric company. So it creates a lot of really good feeling about working at company X. Um, so that al alongside having good policies within the company as to how IP is dealt with can be really super useful because then you know once it comes to generating assets and managing those assets. You know, it's done in a much more ordered way, and that, of course, you know, feeds into your mitigating risk, David. Yeah. Um, we have one. Um, we have one question from 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 the audience, which I'm going to plug in now, um, for for the very reason that kind of like uh, touches on on what you guys just just kind of discuss. Um, and it's a question from uh, Mitesh Motka, and it's a question addressed to both of you. Um, so the question is whether uh, either of you have uh, have had an experience working with third-party litigation funders, and uh, whether do you, whether you have seen an increase uh, in using third-party um, funding um, in the current climate. So, so uh, I can answer from my experience. I mean, um, as a as an industry, third-party funders it, it, it has exploded over the last few years um, and there's more of them they're raising more and more funds so so they are it, it's it's an established industry now my experience is that um, because of the way IP claims operate in that often the end game is an injunction as opposed to recovering significant damages they're not hugely attractive to third-party funders um, because the, the types of claims they like are the ones where you're going to recover significant damages of which they will, they will take a percentage um but it's only really in the kind of farmer patent litigation and you know the, the, the really valuable like patent litigation may be the the, the, the iphone wars etc where significant damages were recoverable and certainly in the uk damages are, are really significant so although it is possible to find third, third party funders it's very hard to do so yeah, if I could just add to that, I spoke to a third-party funder, I think it was just before Christmas, um, and we had a good chat, but really what came out of that was essentially they um, they operate like a, a VC fund. Um, so as such, they probably only fund about one in a thousand of, of what comes through to them, you know, maybe one in a hundred, sorry, that's a better term. Um, you know, probably about one in a hundred of, of the actual applications that come through to them are, are those that get funded. So that's a very small amount, but they do look at all the rest of them. And obviously they go through a lot of sifting 
until you get that uh, investment from them. And it is an investment, and they will you know, they will want paid at the end, as David has pointed out. So that's how they're looking at it. Um, so there's a lot of yeah, you're not just going to get funded that easy. Yeah. I guess. Another point I would add is that um, clearly IP disputes are very subjective, and it's really up to the judge to decide if he thinks an IP right has been infringed or not. And sometimes it's very difficult to make that call until the judgment arrives in your office. Um, in my experience, more often than not, it was hard to say which way the the, 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 the uh, claim had gone until the very end. So that uncertainty is not good for, for funders. So again, that's another reason why they don't tend to get involved with IP claims. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, actually, actually, just to... Um a question not so related on onto uh, our our post here so well we've got a question when looking for a, a tech solution for your ip what are you looking for uh cost scalability brand none of the above uh, we have four answers so far and they're all different um you know we found ourselves in a, in a bit of an interesting situation um to say the least um, and in the in the IP world, we've seen a lot of calls for open innovation. Um, whether that's going to be open innovation in relation specifically to 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 solving the pandemic that we found ourselves in, or or overall, um, in your line of business, when it comes to open innovation, uh, what do you think are the complications that can arise uh, from? From, from that maybe maybe we start with, with you david from from an insurance perspective uh, oh it's hideous <laughs> it helps <laughs> um I mean, it, uh, all open innovation will be subject to certain rules and regulations agreed between the parties and uh as we all know um anything that's written down in an agreement is open to interpretation so uh, if people are sharing IP, it, it can lead to disputes one way or another. Uh, it, in principle, if everyone's sharing all IP, then there will be no disputes. But if you're just sharing a pool of, say, patents, uh, then th th there is always a concern that um, someone will um, go beyond the scope of the license in error or it, 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 um, uh, on purpose. So there, there's that additional risk that one minute they're using it within the scope of a license, um, that's been granted and and then for whatever reason they're not and then the dispute arises so there's always that additional risk i mean what what i have seen a lot of been reading a lot of in the last couple of weeks is how companies are pooling patents a lot of tech companies are pooling their patents that they think might be helpful in dealing with a pandemic and giving standard licenses to third parties to use um and i see that the licenses would expire exactly a year after the who um confirm the pandemic has passed. So whilst there, there wouldn't be any litigation during that period, it, it's difficult to know if there will be a huge uptick in litigation beyond the expiry of those licenses for, for you know people carrying on um, using the patents when they're, they're not licensed to do so. So in theory, it's a, obviously it's a good thing, certainly at the moment, but in terms of the litigation risk, it's it can be a bit messy. Um, what, what about your perspective, Richard? I, I know that you're, you're somewhat skeptical when it comes to uh, uh, open innovation. From from my standpoint, I, I, I feel that it was more, um, um, it's kind of similar to my affection to, to, to socialism. When I was in, in uh, high school and university, you know, I was very passionate about it. But the older I, I, I grew, I kind of figured that it, it doesn't work. It's, it's kind of the same with open innovation and, and you, isn't it? Yeah, you know, everyone sees that nice sort of Henry Chesbrough, you know, open innovation graphic, and it all looks, it all just looks wonderful. Um, but, you know, in, in practice, it, it, it does have a lot of fairly complicated elements. And, you know, certainly um, open innovation has been used to, let's just say, exploit people and exploit smaller entities um, generally coming from larger entities and you know to some extent that's just capitalism and you it's, there's nothing illegal about it so it's just business so 
you know, people if people are happy to sort of sign up to the open innovation terms in that sense, what's wrong with that? It was all done freely. Um, I think for me, what I find is it, it can sully the waters, as as David has, has sort of a, you know pointed out. It can make things you know having multiple um, owners to to something um, can make things very complicated when it comes to you know commercialization because you start to get into issues of well who makes the decision about you know whether this license um, you know license level or royalty rate that we've chosen is correct do we have to ask everybody you know and 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 sometimes you get someone in the group because it takes a long time to make a decision. Um, or never makes the decision, or does said does something that is just completely inappropriate. Uh, so you know those are, are are real occurrences. I've personally experienced those um, in a sort of a, a joint IP situation. Uh, so you know that can be an issue. But I think you know if we look at the other the other side of open innovation. Um, I mean, David has mentioned there the you know various people coming together with COVID nineteen, and certainly um, people have done that, and I've seen just today uh, research universities I think in Ireland have come to get banded together to give a some sort of free license. I don't know the the details of it, but you know it's it's very good in that sense. Uh, and then of course you've got you know larger organisations like the Open Innovation Network uh, in the US. Um, and they even give uh, IP away on the condition that you don't sue anybody in the network. Uh, so, you know, in some senses, that can be really good. Um, you know, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm getting the Open Innovation Network and the Lot Network. And <laughs> so many networks, all these networks. The Lot Network, that's exactly what they do. Yeah, um, I'm not, I don't know so much about the Open Innovation Network. Uh, so, Lot Network. They they do that, um, so yeah, it's 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 not a bad idea in, in principle, but comp more complicated in reality. So yeah, have no. some sort of circumspection about it. Yeah, uh, I mean it's 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 all good and 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 until a while people get along, because I, I guess you know it's it, it's like a it's like a nice plot of land uh, owned by a family that doesn't get on. <laughs> so. Yeah, you know. that, that's that's true, and um, I guess I've always had a certain unease when I see a you know a huge global multinational um, saying to the world, "Look, we've got this really complicated problem. You know, we've tried for years to fix it ourselves, or we haven't even. Maybe we've tried not tried at all. But we've got this problem. We really want to get it fixed. We'll give you five thousand dollars if if you come up with a solution for us, and everyone comes up with a solution." Um, and of course, in that, in the terms and conditions of it, you know that five thousand dollars reward, they hand over all their IP to the company, um, and you know that's great for the for the, the the company running the competition, but you know not not so great for the the the, the little person, um, the the little person, um, or it can, might not, not not isn't always a little person, uh, it is sometimes maybe a university which maybe isn't being as as well represented there. Um, or as a, in terms of getting remuneration for its uh, very significant efforts, uh, if it's coming up with a good solution. You, you do have the counter argument, uh, though, Richard. I mean, uh, an idea is nothing without an action. You're right. So You're there, right. There, there, there are people with some fantastic ideas out there, but they only remain ideas because they yeah. either don't have the capacity to action or maybe they don't, they don't have the means to action. So certainly... Um, we have to uh, consider the fact that a, a lot of times those universities or individuals are very much underpaid um, for 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 their ideas. But from uh, you, you know uh, a global perspective, we either see those ideas come to life and flourish for the benefit of all, than just remain ideas. So no, I hundred percent agree with that. Um, you know. It does. It, it is a team effort, um, commercialization. Um, so it, it's, you know, uh, please, you know, no one go away with the idea that I view this in a sort of some, mm. you know, nice simplistic way, because that is definitively not the case. Um, you, you're absolutely right that, you know, a lot of those ideas that people will send and will be completely, you know, bonkers. Um, they they won't make any sense at all. 
Um, but equally, there will be you know some really good ones there, and some people who don't have the connections to really get that idea taken forward. They don't have the the wherewithal. So it, it, it is important that, that those ideas do get out there to the wider world. And many times people don't are totally happy with with the with the deal that they get. So that's that's also not a bad thing either. They just they just want to see the idea being used. So you know it's not all bad. So um, before before I, I I go to our last question, um, we have our last poll. Uh, that is to run. Um, it is uh, a, a question provided by, by Richard, actually. And, and it states, why should organizations develop an IP strategy? Um, so please go and put your answers there. Um, and in the meantime, I'm going to ask my panel the last question. Yesterday, as we were rehearsing this, uh, I was planning to ask you to make a wild prediction for, uh, for the brave new world of IP. But I've changed my mind. I want to. Oh, I, want, an idea. <laughs> I want you. I want you guys to make a comforting prediction. I think that we have all had uh, enough of bad news out there. I, I. I think that we need some some comforting news. Um, so, so could could you could you please make a one comforting prediction for for the sake of all of us uh, when it comes to IP in, in the new world? Shall I, shall I go ahead? I mean, <laughs> okay. I, 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 well, I think. Um, I, th I think. Uh, technology is going to play a massive part going forward in, 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 in IP, as it will in most industries. But I think, I think it won't be long before uh, AI will be uh, doing patent searches completely and also drafting patents. So I'm hoping the cost of patenting and the time it takes to get a patent will fall significantly over the next five, ten years. Um, so that should be of some comfort to, uh, to right holders. And not to attorneys. <laughs> you, 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 it's, it's, it's on you, Richard. Um, yes, in, in terms of a comforting prediction, yeah, or a comforting sort of warm, nice statement. <laughs> yeah, I think what this um, what this crisis has done is to um, bring people closer together, even though they're further apart. Um, and I mean that closer together in a sort of um, emotional sense if you like um, people have had to engage you know because it, it takes a little bit more I think emotional energy to engage through a video cam than it does to do so just sort of you know bumping into someone in a corridor if you like um, so you know really uh, facilitating and making these uh, connections work has for those of us who have engaged with it I think it has enabled a, um, a a sort of a closer connection, and if you don't mind, I do have the wild the wild prediction. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I do think actually that the the, um, the what will come out of this is a lot of really new and good innovation, which will be um, you know manifesting itself in in ways which were, where it, if people have had to adjust to these new circumstances that's created new sets of uh, problems which will create all sorts of new solutions and uh, demand all sorts of new solutions that highly innovative people will come up with um, and, and I think you know I mean this is not highly original but uh, I do think there'll be a lot more virtual experiences will will have will, will arise during this period um, you know that people can maybe do things online uh, a little bit more and you know because people have had these sort of you know glasses and you know around for quite a few years now and people have been developing various tech around that but I guess people's interest in that has been a bit well that's a bit that's a bit weird um, mm -hmm. it's not really for me um, you know but now if if you're sat at home and you really can't go out you're locked in so to speak or you know, and maybe even some people just don't even want to go out at the present time. Um, you know, they're going to be more open to engaging with those sorts of technologies and those sorts of experiences. You know, maybe I don't know, walking around a museum or something. And I mean, it's not a new idea. Someone came to me a few years ago with such an idea. Um, and they were talking to me about that. Uh, so, you know, but I think people will engage with it more in a way they haven't done before. 
So, so innovation really is uh, in, in inevitable when it's forced by by change, right? So, Absolutely. And um, we have a few few questions from from the audience. Uh, one one question to you, uh, David, um, and it's a question from Robert Marcus. Hi, Robert. Um, actually, Robert is a client of ours. Good to see you on here. Uh, is intellectual property insurance now part of the merger and acquisitions transactions? Yes, yeah, so um, quite a big driver of my business is um, warranty and indemnity uh, insurance relating to the IP warranties that are given in, in those situations. So um, a, a couple of insurers have now um, launched products specifically relating to those risks. So it's certainly um, becoming more popular. Um, warranty and indemnity insurance is widely available, but they often exclude the IP warranties because they don't because the people offering the insurance don't always understand the, the risk associated with the IP warranties. But now there are specific IP policies that look at that risk. Yeah. Okay. Well, if there is, if there is further, Robert, I will liaise uh, uh, you with, with David and you can ask a few, few more questions in relation to that. Uh, we have one more question to you, David. You're very popular today. Uh, <laughs> So, um, uh, does Safeguard IP purely consider before the event solutions, or do you also broker for after the event insurance? So, predominantly before the event. Um, I have in the past looked into after the event insurance for clients, but the reality is it's hugely expensive. So, you're often looking at premiums about 60 to 70 percent of the amount of cover you're looking to purchase. So, if you're looking for a million pounds worth of cover premiums could be upwards of six hundred thousand pounds so it's hugely expensive um they tend to only cover the other side's costs so if you lose and uh they will cover your exposure to other side's costs so it's hard to find a solution where your costs uh, are included in the in the policy so overall I, although i have investigated the market i've spent a lot of time and deals always fall over at the last minute because the, the the maths never will really work out um when you look at before the event insurance the premiums are one to three percent of the amount of cover you're looking for so i advise my clients it's always better to get insurance in place before the event because it's <laughs> significantly cheaper than once the issues arisen yeah okay possible but they're unlikely then i, I, I take it i mean it's it's possible if if, if you've got the I mean, the crazy thing is, yeah, you have to show that, that your prospects of succeeding in the claim are, are more than good. Um, yeah. And if they are more than good, query why you need the hugely expensive um, policy in the first place. Okay. Well, I think that that was our last last question. If there are no more questions, uh, I wish to thank both Richard and, and David today. Okay. It was an absolute pleasure. Um, we'll be we'll be having more content in in the coming weeks, guys. So stay stay tuned. Um, before we finish, I just want to reveal the last uh, outcome of of the of the poll that was uh, circulated by by Richard. So 11% of people um, recognize and understand what their intangible assets are. Uh, 55 align their intangible assets with their corporate goals. I'm happy to see that. Uh, and and 22% uh, generate uh, more more revenue. That's what they consider IP strategy. Uh, and and finally, 11% um, see IP strategy as unlocking new opportunities. Uh, all of all of the of the polls and 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 the answers along with the recording today will be circulated uh, to everyone uh, that was here and everyone that couldn't make it but registered. So thank you very much. Uh, you have a great day. Thanks, Simon. And, and, and great weekend. Super. Bye. Bye. Thanks.